On July 13, 1956, China's first liberation automobile rolled off the assembly line, which opened the prelude to the development of China's automobile industry. In fact, the relationship between China and automobiles can even be traced back to the 17th to 18th years of Kongxi, that is, between 1678 and 1679 AD. At that time, the Jesuit priest in the Qing dynasty, Belgian Nanhuiren trial produced a Branca impulsive steam wheel in Beijing and put it on a wooden four-wheeled trolley to become a walking trolley. This is nearly a hundred years earlier than the recognized first automobile in the world the steam automobile trial produced by Frenchman Nicolas Gaunod in 1769. Of course, Nanhuiren's trial-produced car can only be regarded as a small car model. It doesn't have much practical value, and it's just a toy to please Emperor Kongxi. In 1901, Hungarian lines brought two cars into the Shanghai concession which was the first time that real cars entered China with evidence. Since then, more cars have been shipped into China from abroad, including cars dedicated to Empress Dowager Cixi. However, because Cixi thought it was inappropriate for the driver to sit in front of her, she ordered the driver to kneel and drive, and finally they give up. From being complacent in the past to now, Chinese cars have embarked on the road of export. Now China's auto production and sales have already ranked first in the world, and the Chinese auto industry has also begun to lead the development of global electrification and intelligence. So how did the Chinese, who started so late, build their own cars and their own industrial system? In this video, let's talk about the three breakthroughs of China-made cars. OK, let's get started. In 1949, the first year of the founding of the People's Republic of China, due to the melee for decades, arable land was deserted, factories collapsed, and tens of thousands of kilometers of railways, 3,200 bridges, and more than 200 tunnels were destroyed. The former Paramount Kingdom has actually become the poorest country with an annual per capita national income of 27 US dollars which is even far lower than that of 44 US dollars in the whole of Asia. Faced with such a mess, Chairman Mao Zedong said, what can we do now? We can make tables and chairs, teapots, tableware, and paper, but not even a car, a plane, a tank, or a tractor. At the end of 1949, Mao Zedong went to the Soviet Union. On February 14, 1950, that is, after Mao Zedong stayed in the Soviet Union for more than two months, China and the Soviet Union finally finalized a batch of key industrial projects that the Soviet Union assisted China to build. These eight projects, also known as Project 156 later, cover almost all core industrial fields such as energy, metallurgy, chemical industry, machinery, and light industry, including an automobile factory project. China needs car factories too much, because in those days, the Chinese have suffered a lot from the lack of cars. After the Korean War broke out in 1950, the Chinese army had only more than 1,300 vehicles, but in the first week, 217 vehicles were damaged by enemy planes. Because of the shortage of vehicles, food and winter clothing could not be delivered to the front line in time so there were many soldiers eating potatoes in single clothes in the ice and snow. From 1949 to 1979, in 30 years, China achieved a breakthrough in automobile production from scratch. This breakthrough, some people say it was a success, because China has created Jiafeng and Dongfeng brand cars. But some people say that it failed, because Chinese can only build trucks, but never achieved mass production of cars. In fact, only the manufacturing capacity of cars can represent a country's real car-making strength. Apart from the fact that it is much more difficult and delicate to build a car than a truck, there is also a subjective reason the Chinese believed that driving a car was a bourgeois way of life at the time, and only public officials could take a car for their official business needs. But after the reform and opening up, as some people got rich first, the people's desire for cars became stronger and stronger. 
On the other hand, the automobile market demand in developed Western countries such as the United States is beginning to be saturated. In 1970, the United States completed the process of urbanization. In 1980, when the US economy reached its peak, there were 711 cars for every 1,000 people at that time. Except for the elderly and children, almost everyone had one car. For the Fords, if they wanted to grow steadily, there was only one way to go expand exports. This is also the bottom-level thrust of Nixon's visit to China in 1972 and the establishment of diplomatic relations between the United States and China in 1979. They not only want to win China over to fight the Soviet Union, but they also want to sell Chinese cars, cokes, and shampoo to make money. On one side is the Chinese auto market, which is seriously in short supply, and on the other side is the Western auto market, which is oversupplied. The two are like dry firewood and a fire. From 1983 to 1987, local governments spent 16 billion US dollars in foreign exchange to import cars, equivalent to the net fixed assets of the two Chrysler auto companies at that time. The second breakthrough of Chinese cars is the same as the first breakthrough. Some people say it succeeded because the domestic auto industry is prosperous, but others say it failed because China has been doing things like assembling cars, and there has been no complete localization. The key to the success or failure of localization is the localization of components. The automobile industry originally had a huge industrial chain. An automobile factory needed thousands of parts suppliers to serve it directly. It is this huge industrial system that determines the height of a country's automobile industry. The German Der Spiegel Weekly said a truth. There are hardly any parts factories in China, and Shanghai Volkswagen seems to be left on an isolated island for production. Automobile manufacturing was originally a technology-intensive industry, but in China, it has become labor-intensive. According to the Smile Curve theory, in the automotive industry chain, the most profitable areas are design, R&D, and parts production, and the least profitable is the assembly link, which is what Chinese are doing. This is also the root cause of the generally low wages in China's auto industry in recent years. China is very ambitious, but in the end it has become a long-term worker working for foreigners. We have to admit that in the past 100 years, Western developed countries have formed extremely high technical barriers and industrial chain advantages in the automobile industry. In 2018, two giants of BYD and Ningda era emerged in China in the field of new energy, as well as a number of new car manufacturers such as Weili, Xiaoping, and Idea. And traditional fuel car companies such as FAW, Second Automobile, Saic, and Geely have also started the layout of new energy vehicles. In just 20 years, China has not only established a complete supply chain system for new energy vehicles, but has basically achieved localization in the core areas of new energy vehicles, batteries, motors, and electronic controls, and some core technologies have even surpassed Western developed countries, for example, in terms of batteries, BYD and CATL have rushed to the top five in the world in the era. As early as 2015, China has officially overtaken the United States, becoming the world's largest new energy vehicle market and the world's largest power battery producer. Until today, China has finally squeezed into the train of the new energy era with a platform ticket in the era of fuel vehicles, and also sat in business class. Okay. That's all for today. Do you want to learn about more auto stories? Please keep following our channel and like our videos. See you.